How I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. I'm singing, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, our strength and our Redeemer, our shield and our buckler, Father, we come this morning to say thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your healing power, your anointing, your protection. So many wonderful things, Heavenly Father, that you have done to us, through us, and for us. We can't name all of the wonderful things that you have done for us, your little children. That's why we just pause reverently to sing hallelujah, to thank you, Heavenly Father. For you are God and beside you, there is none other. Thank you, Father, for not dealing with us as our sins and iniquities deserve. Thank you for your mercy, Father, your grace, your long suffering, your patience with us, your little children. We give your name all glory. We give your name all honor. We give your name all praise. Father, we pray that as we study your holy scripture today, you will speak, Father. Speak to us, speak through us, speak for us, that your people in the four corners of the earth may be edified, uplifted, strengthened, and encouraged. That your name, Father, which is above every other name, may be glorified, honored, and praised. These and all other blessings, Father, we ask and we count done in Jesus' mighty name. We have prayed Let God's people around the world say amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, children of God. I do greet each of you once again in the mighty and the precious name of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. For those of you Worshiping with us for the first time, I am Apostle Robert Bryant, pastor of the Christian Center Church Worldwide, headquarters here in Kenston, North Carolina, USA, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Living the Word, a place where sound doctrine is brought to the ears of millions of God's people all over the world. We do thank God for each of you. We pray the Lord is blessing you very well wherever this broadcast is locating you. For those of you that have been worshiping with us, you know that we have been working and are about to conclude our most recent topic entitled, Whoever Does Evil. We thank God that through special revelation of God, We understand that from time to time, each of us 
commits evil. We, we have not yet been made perfect. We have not yet obtained all of this. So we thank God. One of the things we thank God for is that he uh, does not deal with us as our evil deeds deserve. Our Heavenly Father, because of our faith that we have placed in his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, he has forgiven us of our evil deeds. He has forgiven us of our iniquities. That is has been the part that God has played in our lives. Now, the part that we need to play in God's life is we need to be trying just as hard as we can not to commit evil and not to commit sin. We've been working on our topic, whoever does evil, we understand that it is, it is, that goes for us too, because we do evil, but we want to be coming out. We want to be uh, letting evil go so that we can walk in the righteousness that God has destined for you and for me. We're going to look at the book of James chapter 1 with a special focus on verse 13. James chapter 1, verse 13. James, the half-brother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, writes, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone? We are concluding our topic, whoever does evil. Part five, let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our strength and our Redeemer. Father, speak to us, through us and for us that your people may be strengthened, blind eyes may be opened, deaf ears unstopped, that your name, which is above every other name, may be glorified, honored, and praised. This is our prayer, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Let God's people say amen. Whoever does evil, part five. Praise the living God. Saints, we are about to conclude this particular topic, and we thank God for the many great revelation and insight that he has shared with us in regards to uh, whoever does evil. We thank him for letting us to know that that is us sometimes too that it's not just the evil men and evil women but it is sometimes us as righteous men and righteous women we do evil sometimes too but we also thank god because he does not deal with us as our evil deeds deserve because of our faith in jesus christ god's mercy has been extended in your life and in my life. Now, now God is dealing with me on something in my spirit. Humanity, God says, Robert, they will either receive the mercy of God or they will receive the wrath of God. Now watch this, children of God. Because we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, God's only begotten son. Our sins, our iniquities, our mistakes, our blunders, our shortcomings, the mistakes we make, God extends his mercy upon us. Because we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we can now receive God's mercy. Whereas the world that has not placed their faith in Jesus Christ, when Christ returns, he will be treading out the, the grapes of wrath on humanity. My, listen to me, my brother. Listen to me, my sister. You and I can either receive the mercy of God 
for you and I can receive the wrath of God. My prayer for you, my prayer for me, may we receive the mercy of God. Listen, the wrath of God is no joke. The Bible tells us that it is a terrible thing or it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In other words, to experience God's wrath is a dreadful, terrible thing. All it takes is placing your faith in God's only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to now receive God's mercy. My pr- I don't know who God has sent me here to talk to this morning. But that is my prayer for you. That is my prayer for me. I guarantee you this, my brother or my sister. We are going to like the mercy of God better than we will like the wrath of God. We are going to like the mercy of God more than we are going to like the wrath of God. Now, we're talking about whoever does evil, part five. It is important that to understand that there are things that go before doing evil. Now, this is what the Lord was dealing with me on and and wants me to share with his people this morning. There are there are things that take place and go before doing evil. In other words, you don't just do evil. I don't just do evil. There's some things that, that take place before and we need to be cognizant. We need to be aware that there are things that take place before you and I doing evil. All right, let's look at what the scripture says. James chapter one, verse 13, James writes to us that when tempted, now understand that temptation or being tempted goes before doing evil. Again, we don't just do evil. There's something that goes before that. There there was something that went before our great ancestor, Adam, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't just start eating. There were things that went before. and, And what the adversary does not want you, does not want me to do, is to be aware or to be knowledgeable of the things that go before us doing evil. He just wants us to think we have just done evil. No, we didn't just do evil. There are some things that went before our doing evil that need to be examined. And one of the main things that needs to be examined before you and I perform evil is that there is a temptation that has taken place. In other words, we have had before we did evil or performed evil, there was a temptation. There was there was something in us that desired something evil. We saw something that we liked or we we smelled something or we tasted something or we lusted after something. Men and women don't just do evil. They must be tempted. So the Bible is letting us to know that when tempted, See, when we are tempted, even though we haven't done anything evil yet, we may not have committed any sin yet, but we are already on shaky ground because what temptation is, temptation is the inner desire to do evil. Now, it's it's one thing when we see a person perform evil or when they have done evil, that's, you know, that's obvious, but what can't be seen easily is temptation. See, and that much in temptation is like the inner evil or the inner desire to do evil inside of you and inside of me. So before we can be delivered from evil, which is the manifestation of the outer temptation, we need to be delivered from temptation, which is the inner manifestation of evil. Look at James 1, chapter 13, for those of you just joining us. When tempted, so what is happening? When we are tempted, 
when you are tempted, when I am tempted, what is happening inside of you and inside of me, there is a desire for something that God is telling us not to have. It may be a desire for some money that God, that 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 we want to go out and steal, or it may be a desire for some sex that we want to go out and have, or it may be a desire for somebody else's car that it, it, it is tempted. When you and I are tempted, we are desiring something that God does not want us to have. My prayer for you, my prayer for me, may God deliver us from temptation in the mighty name of Jesus. Temptation is an inner desire for something that God does not want us to have. Now look at the scripture. The Bible says that when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. Now, now what is the scripture letting us know? Temptation is never something that comes from God. Tests may come from God, but temptation is always a result of something evil inside of you, something evil inside of me. The Bible says when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me for God cannot be tempted by evil. Now watch this. Now, this is why Jesus was never tempted by evil. Jesus was God in the likeness of sinful man. He looked like us. He walked a lot like us. He talked a lot like us, but he was never tempted by evil. Why? Because there was nothing in him that desired evil. Inside of you, inside of me, inside of us as human beings, there is something that we desire that is evil. Might be money, might be power, might be sex. Might be there is something, and and this is how the adversary oftentimes gets us because he knows that there is something that you and I like or, or are tempted by in this earth. Jesus wasn't. Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth and all their splendor, and Jesus was like, "Nah." Satan took Jesus up on a high pinnacle and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth, all their splendor. In other, in other words, all the women, all the, the wine, all the song, all the money, and anything, anything. And basically, Jesus said, no. Now, see, you and me, there's a passage in Proverbs that says a man will transgress for a piece of bread. In other words, you and me, with this sinful nature that we are walking around in, the, the, the Bible said we'll, we'll transgress for a piece of bread. We get hungry enough and somebody offer a piece of bread and we'll, we'll do something. We'll do something. Why? Because we have a sinful nature. Jesus never had a sinful nature. We get tempted by evil because there is evil in us. Jesus was never tempted by evil because there was no evil in him. Look at what the Bible says. God cannot be tempted by evil. Why? Why can God not be tempted by evil? Because there's no desire for evil in him. Why can you and I be tempted by evil? Because there is a desire for evil inside of us as human beings. Now, what I may be tempted by, you may not be tempted by. What you may be tempted by, I may not be tempted by. But in each one of us, there is a desire for something evil. You say, Apostle, how do you know? Because we all sin. And we cannot sin without a desire for something evil. First John 1 and 8 says, if any man claims he has no sin, he deceives himself and the truth is not in him. So inside of you, inside of me, there is a desire for what is evil. This is why we ask the Lord every day, forgive us this, give, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts or forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our sins. 
depending on which translation you have. Why? Because every day we commit debts, we commit sins, we commit trespasses against one another and against our creator. Jesus didn't have to pray that. Jesus didn't have to ask God to forgive him of his sins. He didn't commit any sins. But you and I have to ask God to forgive us of our sins every single day because every single day we do something we shouldn't do. Every single day we say something we shouldn't say. Every single day we think something that we shouldn't think. This is why we need Jesus, my brother and my sister. See, Jesus is, is the go-between between a sinful man and a holy God. Jesus is, is able to go between. Jesus is able to connect a sinful man on this side, you and me, with a holy righteous and pure God on this side. How, how can you connect up a, a sinful man with a holy, righteous, and pure God? Can't do it. But through Christ, it can be done. This is why you and I must place our faith in Jesus Christ, the only acceptable sacrifice, the only one that can reconnect a sinful wretch like you and me with a holy, righteous, and pure God, such as our Heavenly Father. God can't be tempted by evil, but we can. See, not only can God not be tempted by evil, the Bible says, nor does he tempt anyone. So God does, God can't be tempted by evil and God is not tempting us. But yet we find ourselves tempted every day. Why? Because in us, there is a desire for things, people, places that God doesn't want us to have inside of us. See, the desire for sin is inside of you and inside of me. Before we ever commit sin, the desire. So so uh, oftentimes, children of God, we want to pray and ask God to help us with desires. Desires that are not pleasing in his sight. God cannot be tempted by evil. Neither does he tempt anyone. Watch verse 14. But each one is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. You say, Apostle, what does that mean? Inside of you, inside of me, there are evil desires that are trying to, to drag us off, trying to drag us away from Christ, trying to drag us away from what is right, trying to drag us away from uh, what we're supposed to be doing. These evil desires want to drag us off, kicking and screaming. And this is one this is one of the things that you and I are fighting in our walk with Christ is these desires that are in us that we know are not like God. Evil desires. So we have to be mindful, children of God, of desires. Evil desires are inside of you. Evil desires are inside of me. You know, you know, if we're not careful, we can start thinking something is wrong with us because we have evil desires. Listen, the Bible says no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. In other words, what you are struggling with in your walk with Christ, we all struggling with. Now, many individuals may not admit it. Many individuals may not want to own up to it, but the reality is there is no temptation that has seized you except what is common to man. Now, what is common to man? The Bible says the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The lust of the eye means we see some things that we want that we shouldn't have. The lust of the flesh means that our sinful nature wants some things that we shouldn't have. The pride of life mean that we are boasting about some things that we shouldn't be boasting about. These are the three things the Bible says that men struggle with, bishops struggle with, the apostle is struggling with, the pastor is struggling with no temptation. The Bible says no temptation has seized you 
except what is common to man. So I, I, what I what that lets me know is that what I'm going through, what I'm struggling with, you all struggling with it too. And what you all are struggling with, guess what? I'm struggling with it too. See, so the Bible says that when we are tempted, when we find ourselves tempted, we find ourselves wanting to do something we know God doesn't want us to do, or we find ourselves wanting him to go somewhere that God doesn't want us to go, or we find ourselves, when we are, when we are tempted, we should not say God is tempting me. God cannot be tempted by evil. Watch what the Bible says. Nor does he tempt anyone. God cannot be tempted by evil, and nor does he tempt anyone. Watch this, verse 14. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires. You say, Apostle, what are you letting know? The problem is inside of you. The problem is inside of me. Listen, the problem is not uh, 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 cocaine. The problem is your or my desire for cocaine. The problem is not beautiful women or beautiful men or handsome men. The problem is your or my desire for these things. So, so what we want to God to work on in us and what we want to pray in regard, Lord, Help me with these evil desires in me. I'm not blaming it on my brother. I'm not blaming it on my sister. I'm not blaming it on the white man. I'm not blaming uh-uh, Lord. Lord, I need you to help me with these evil desires that are in me. Look at what the Bible says, verse 14, James 1 and 14, for those of you just joining us. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own own evil desires and enticed. My prayer today for each one of us, may God help us with our own evil desires. May God help us with our own enticements in the mighty name of Jesus. Look at the Bible. So before sin takes place, There is an evil desire that has already taken place inside of you and inside of me. Now, the Lord is bringing something to my spirit now that uh, he wants to have wants me to share with you all. I was in uh, Tanzania maybe about uh, four or five years ago at a pastor's conference there. And uh, we had a couple that was there that owned a hotel, very nice hotel. And they were keeping the ministers that were visiting the conference at their hotel. And, uh, you know, they gave us nice rooms and everything. And and they would come by and check on us. And the husband and the wife, they took a special liking to me and, and some of my team members. And they would come by our room and I'd share, we'd share with them, pray with them and different things. Anyway, one day I had a morning session at the conference. I preached, shared with God's people. And the husband was driving the ministers back to the hotel after our morning session to get ready for the evening session. Let us rest up a little bit. But I went out and got in the vehicle after I finished my session. And we were kind of waiting for some of the other pastors and other ministers and the husband asked me, he said, Apostle, I want to ask you something. I said, what's that man, oh God? He said, Apostle, that man that shot all those people in uh, out of the hotel window, there was a man in Las Vegas that had took an automatic weapon and just shot out of his hotel room and killed all kind of people that were at a conference. He said, Apostle, what, what made him do that? Why, why did he do that? I said, well, well understand this, man, oh God. The Bible instructs you and me to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God 
and bring into subjection every thought to the obedience of Christ. He said, Apostle, what does that mean? I said, what that means is this, man of God, any thought that comes in our mind. I said, now, what happened with that man? Thought came in his mind. The devil brought a thought in his mind. Take your automatic weapon, shoot down out of your hotel room, kill as many people, injure as many people as you possibly can. And instead of him casting that thought down, instead of him getting that out of his mind, saying, no, say not rebuke you in the name of Jesus. No, I'm not going to take this weapon and shoot people that haven't harmed. No, instead of casting it down, he allowed that evil thought to turn into an evil behavior. And that was why he did it. I said, look, man of God, everything we do is a result of you and me either listening to the spirit of God or listening to the spirit of Satan. Now on judgment day, you and I are going to be judged as to whether we listen to the spirit of God or whether we listen to the spirit of Satan. When we sin, we are listening to the spirit of Satan. He is talking to us. He is because God never tells us to sin. God has never told a man to sin. And God says, Robert, I will never tell a man to sin. In my spirit, I'm saying, but Lord, I sin every day. God said, I don't tell you to do it. So who tells you to do it, Robert? I'm like, then it got to be the devil, Lord. Because the Lord has never will never and can never tell us to sin. But we sin every day. So who are we listening to? Satan. Look at what the Bible said. When tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. God said, look, somebody's talking to you, trying to get you to sin. God said, that's not me. In the garden, it was not God that was trying to get Adam to sin. It was the devil. So understand, my brother, understand, my sister, Satan is just as real as God, not as powerful, not as all knowing, not as everywhere at the same time. But Satan is just as real as God. Satan talks to men and women just like God talks to men and women. My encouragement, my prayer for every soul under the sound of my voice, may we not only know when God is talking to us, But may we obey when God is talking to us. Jesus said it like this. My sheep know my voice. And a stranger, they will not follow. My prayer for you, my prayer for me. May we know Jesus' voice. And may we not follow a stranger. May we not follow the adversary. No one should say, the Bible said, look, when tempted, God said, I realize you all are tempted from time to time, but don't be out telling people that I'm tempting you. Man, God is tempting me to go out with this fine, get fine late. No, he's not. God tempted me to steal this money. No, he's not. God does not. God, look, God said, look, Robert, I cannot be tempted by evil, nor do I tempt anyone. Well, I'm like, Lord, what ha- what's happening in the media when I'm, when I'm being tempted? What's going on? The Bible says in verse 14, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then, verse 15, after desire has conceived. Now, understand this, my brother, understand this, my sister. Desire wants to make a baby in you. Desire wants to make a baby in me. Evil desire. You say, Apostle, what does that mean? It says, desire after desire has conceived. So what happens is evil desire. Now, there are two two things involved in sin. There's the evil desire inside of you and inside of me, and then there's the act. So these two things have to get together for sin to 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 basically make a baby just like in order for a baby to be made in the natural father sperm has to get together with the mother's egg and then you have conception well you have to have the evil desire then you have to have the act in order for sin to conceive look at verse 15 and we're about to close this message children of god 
Bible says, then after desire has conceived, desire gets together with the act. Desire, you wanted to do it, now you've done it. Once those things have, those two things have gotten together, just like sperm and egg, when they get together, woman conceived. Once desire, evil desire gets together with the act of sin, look at what the Bible says, it gives birth to sin and sin. Now, sin is one thing. Let, let's understand. Just like a baby is one thing. Baby is one thing and a grown man is a whole nother thing. Well, committing a sin is one thing, but letting sin grow up is another thing. My prayer for you, we commit sins every day, each one of us. My prayer for you, my prayer for me, may our sins not grow up. You say, apostle, what are you saying? Look at what the Bible said. Evil desire, after it has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And then it says, and sin when it is full grown. See, sin wants to grow up in you. Sin wants to grow up in me. It's one thing to commit a sin. That's a little baby. All right, Lord, forgive me. Let me stop. Let me get on the right. That's a little baby. Sin. But when sin grows up inside of you, when sin grows up inside of me, the Bible says when it is fully grown, it gives birth to death. So I want to encourage you, my brother, encourage you, my sister. Though we commit sin every day, we say something we shouldn't say. We think something we shouldn't think. We look at something we shouldn't be looking at. I mean, there's a whole lot of things we do every day that God is not pleased with. See? But work, I encourage you, my brother, don't let the sin, don't let your sins grow up. Sin wants to grow up in you and grow up in me so that it can give birth to death. My prayer for each one of us. May the sins that we commit, we, we know we want to stop and we want to we want. But may the sins that we commit not grow up on us, not become fully grown in us so that they cannot bring forth death in our lives. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Christ wants you and I to live. Christ wants you and I to prosper. Christ wants you and I to experience abundance. Satan wants you and I to die. See, understand what the devil wants in you. The devil wants me. He come but for, thank you, Holy Spirit. He come but for to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So understand, my brother, understand, my sister, as we listen to words, we listen to the word of God, it's going to bring us more toward life. We listen to the word of Satan, it's going to bring us more toward death. We listen to the will of God. It's going to bring us more toward life. We listen to the will of Satan. It's going to bring us more toward death. So we want to even be careful with what we are listening to. Be careful with who we are around. See, there's a passage in the book of Proverbs that says, whoever walks with the wise grows wise. But a companion of fools suffers harm. You, you and I even have to be careful about who we choose to hang around. Listen, I would rather hang around with no one than to hang around with fools. I, I'd rather be by myself. Because God is letting me know in his word that just hanging around fools. See, some of you all think you can hang around fools, but you, you'll be all right because you're not going to do what what they want you to do. Listen, it, it, just walking with fools will cause you and I to suffer harm. It's better to walk alone than to walk with fools. Now, the best is to walk with the wise. Why? Because as we walk with the wise, we grow wise. As I hang around with wise men and wise women, and but I'll grow wise. My prayer for you. My prayer for me. 
May we walk with the wise, that we may grow wise in the mighty and the precious name of Jesus Christ. Well, praise the living God. Praise the living God. When tempted. So I encourage you, my brother, I encourage you, my sister. See, be mindful. Every listen, everything in this life is trying to get you. Let me say it again. Everything in this life is trying to get you and it's trying to get me. Either trying to get us to live or trying to get us to die. See, now we here we are in the middle. We want to be mindful and we want to be cognizant that, you know, things and people and places are either trying to get us to live or trying to get us to die. My prayer for you, my prayer for me, may you have life and have it more abundantly. May I have life and have it more abundantly. Everything in life is trying to get you to live or get you to die. God has his spirit you know, in his apostles, in his prophets, in his evangelists, in his pastors, in his teachers, trying to get you and I to live and to do what God wants us to do. Satan has his spokesmen, his spokeswomen, trying to get you and I to die, telling us all kind of foolishness. There's a passage, thank you, Holy Spirit, in the book of Corinthians that says that the spiritual man makes judgments about all things. But he himself is subject to no man's judgment. You say, Apostle, what does that mean? That means that a wise man or a wise woman is making a judgment about everything, making a judgment about the food that they eat, making a judgment about the people that they are hanging around with, making a judgment about where they're going to live. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things. Listen to me, my brother. Listen to me, my sister. You and I are responsible for every choice we make in this world. You and I will stand before our creator. And the Bible says, give an account of the deeds that we have done while in these mortal bodies. We are in these mortal bodies. You look at me, you see my body. I look at you, I see your body. But the real you, the real me is on the inside of these mortal bodies. Our soul, our eternal soul. You think about when we go to a funeral. Our grandmother, our grandfather has passed away. We go to the funeral. Grandpa's body is in the casket. But his spirit, his soul. Is not in there. He's not breathing. Why? Because his spirit, his soul has gone somewhere else. Yeah. Hopefully it is going to be back and to be in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is my prayer for you. That is my prayer for me. That when our days are done in the land which the Lord thy God has given us, that you and I, our souls, will have a resting place in the arms of the Lord. Our spirits automatically go back to God. Each one of us has spirit, soul, body. Our spirit, that's the breath of life. It came from God, it's going back to God. Our body came from the dust of the earth, it's going back to the dust of the earth. But our soul, my prayer for you and my prayer for me is that our souls will go back to be with the Lord and not have to be sent to the lake of fire and burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. There they will be tormented. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, day and night forever and ever. I you say, Apostle, why are you on here preaching and teaching like this every day? Because I'm 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 trying to turn as many souls away from being sent to the lake of fire and burning sulfur as I possibly can. Whether it's through Facebook, whether it's through YouTube, whether it's through uh, talk show, whether it's through uh, I'm tr trying to reach out that as many souls as possible be turned away 
from that terrible place. In the mighty and the precious name of Jesus Christ. So, children of God, what we understand is that uh, doing evil is something that um, we do and we commit on a on a daily basis. Um, but God has given us a way of escape. You know, the mistakes that we make, the errors that we make, God has given us a way of escape. Uh, uh, confess your sins. God said, you, you, you sin, Robert. You do evil every day. Confess your sin. The Bible says whoever confesses their sins, uh, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses them obtains mercy. You want mercy from God, get in the habit of confessing your sin. Lord,